The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, an AI makes a life or death decision and what it would really take to make the six million dollar man. Plus, we continue our ongoing audiobook serialization of Timothy Zahn's Cobra, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I am Bain Associate Editor and your podcast host, David Afsharirad. Today, DJ Butler talks with Robert E. Hampson about his Bain Books debut novel, The Moon and the Desert, which answers the question, what would it really take to make the $6 million man? But first, the news. Head on over to Bain.com to check out this month's free short story and nonfiction essay. First up, we have Awakenings by Patrick Childs, a story set in his upcoming Escape Orbit novel. On board the spacecraft Magellan, Daisy, an AI tasked with commanding the ship, encounters an unexpected problem. The sole human aboard, Jack Templeton, is not in complete cryostasis. Advice from Earth is almost 13 hours away. With incomplete information, an unknowable outcome, and the clock ticking down, Daisy has her first experience in making a snap decision. And check out Robert E. Hampson's nonfiction essay, which outlines the science behind his novel, The Moon and the Desert. It's called, Whatever Happened to the Bionic Man? When Martin Caden's Cyborg hit bookstore shelves in 1972, it sparked an interest in the field of biomechanics engineering. Soon, the hit television show, The Six Million Dollar Man, followed. For certain readers and viewers, the idea of melding humans with machines was too exciting to leave to fiction. People like Dr. Robert E. Hampson, inspired by the novel and series, dedicated their lives to the field. Indeed, they created it. With the release of his novel, The Moon in the Desert, Hampson has tackled the question, what would it really take to make the $6 million man? Now, in an exclusive essay, he delves into the science behind the novel. That's the short story, Awakenings, by Patrick Childs, and the nonfiction essay, Whatever Happened to the Bionic Man, by Robert E. Hampson. Free to read now at Bain.com. And that's it for the news. Hello and welcome. This is uh, DJ Dave Butler. I'm here with Robert E. Hampson to talk about his new novel, The Moon and the Desert. It is out now in trade paperback and also all your favorite ebook formats, which you can get DRM free uh, if you buy them at Bain.com uh, as always. Robert E. Hampson, PhD, is a neuroscientist and author. By day, he's a professor at Wake Forest School of Medicine, studying how our brains encode memory. By night, he writes military adventure and hard science science fiction, as well as nonfiction articles explaining science to the general public. Robert's SF writing career began with several pieces of short fiction published in 2015. He now has three collaborative novels in the Four Horsemen universe, published by Seventh Seal Press, and two solo novels, one forthcoming in 2023 from Bain Books. That's uh, that's The Moon in the Desert. He has co-edited two anthologies, published more than 25 uh, works of short fiction. Dr. Hampson's scientific career has concentrated on understanding the effects of drugs, diseases, drugs, disease, and injury on human memory. As lead scientist for Brain Grade Inc., he is helping to develop a medical device to restore human memory function. He is a teacher, researcher, reviewer, scientific journal editor, and consultant. Uh, and my friend, Rob, uh, welcome to the uh, Bain Free Radio Hour. Oh, thank you, Dave. I really appreciate it. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you. Um, I, I'd love to talk for a minute, and I want to talk to you about the book. I'm very excited about the book. I liked it quite a lot for a lot of reasons. Um, but I, I am curious about the research that you do. Um, let me tell you how I summarized it in like one sentence to my kids, and you can say, no, Dave, that's totally wrong. I said, I, said, I believe what Rob, some of the work that Rob is doing involves uh, putting... Um, 
an electrode or something like an electrode into uh, the brains of lab animals and uh, uh, allowing them to store memories or inducing them to store memories on these physically inserted objects, which we hope may have uh, applications for things like Alzheimer's or other kinds of brain injuries. Now, how far off am I? You're actually pretty close. Okay. So a lot of the work that I have done, we do have to use the electrodes to uh, get into the brain, get into the right brain areas so that we can uh, determine what activity of the brain is associated with correct memory function. The whole idea okay. is that we're trying to, uh, we want to be able to restore correct memory function. Because if you think of diseases like Alzheimer's disease, but also traumatic brain injury, stroke, um, and uh, those are diseases where there is a loss of memory. There's also a few disorders where there is an abnormally strong memory, such as PTSD mm -hmm. and in drug abuse relapse. So the whole idea is a better understanding of how memory works so that we can fix it when it doesn't. And so, yes, we put the electrodes in and we are looking for the normal patterns that are there in successful memory and then trying to determine if it's possible to make that normal pattern when it's not there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I, uh, fantastic. So um, the hard science, your, your science background really, really shows in sort of the hard science fiction that you write, I think. Um, let's, let's talk about the setup of the moon in the desert. Cause uh, one way to think about this, I, I, I would offer is this sort of a hard science fiction retelling of an homage to the $6 million man. In fact, I think that's pretty, um, that's, that's pretty much it. That's, I think it that's exactly so. correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, all right. So tell us about our, pro our protagonist, Glenn, Glenn Shepard. Who is Glenn Shepard? Glenn Shepard was a young man who grew up in the shadow of the space program. His, he was born on the 20th of July, 1999, the 30-year uh, anniversary of the moon landing. Family name was Shepard. And the, um, uh, and his father had wanted to name him Glenn as a family name. And of course, with two names that were associated with astronauts, then by all means, he needed to get a middle name appropriate to his birth date. And so he, Glenn Armstrong Shepard, is a young man who actually lost his parents at a young age and Yet it and, and it and it directed him not so much to be an astronaut, but to become a doctor. And he becomes a doctor and he's studying space medicine and particularly emergency medicine in space. And that takes him into the Space Force, into the space program. And it is his dream to be the lead doctor on a mission to Mars. And that is something that drives him. He wants to do this. It's, it's a tribute to his father. It's a tribute to his family. Uh, his medicine background is a tribute to his mother. And uh, it also uh, is a tribute to his aunt and uncle who raised him as well. So he's doing this for them. He's doing it for himself. And his driving force is he's going to go to Mars. And sounds like a certain billionaire that many people know of. Uh, he's going to go to Mars and he's going to be the doctor in charge. And uh, that billionaire uh, may not be on the screen, but but maybe there's a bit of a nod to him too, right? In that um, in the story, now this must be, it's in the 2030s, is that right? Uh, uh, yes, it's actually, uh, it, it starts around 2039, moves into the 2040s. In the 2040s. So, um, and there is a private company, Mars X, which yeah. in conjunction with the Space Force, it's sort of, there's some elements of private public partnership and kind of characters who sort of a little unclear what their chain of command is. I'm a civilian, but man, I'm working with this guy, General Boatwright, and right, so there's uh, a, lot, a lot of fun kind of color there. But Mars X is basically um, 
Now we never actually see Mars, right? And we don't, we don't, we don't get to Mars in the novel, but Mars X is making progress to getting out there. Um, but that's not where, uh, that's not where we start the story. We start the story on the moon, right? With a, right. with an accident. We do. Uh, Glenn, or Shep, as his friends call him, was monitoring a test flight. And I took great inspiration from the events of the Apollo program. And so Apollo fans will see lots of Easter eggs in the, in the book. But just with, as with the Apollo program, they were testing a trainer for the lunar lander and had lots and lots of problems. In this case, uh, Glenn is monitoring a test of a flyer for the surface of Mars. And because it is so delicate because of the wing structure and everything, it can't be tested on Earth. It has to be tested either in space or on the moon. But of course, on the moon, we don't have an air, any atmosphere, so they, they can't fly it. And so it's being tested with thrusters and, and rockets to simulate how it would maneuver. And it becomes unstable and crashes and traps the pilot. Glenn is a doctor. And we will come to learn that he is driven to help people. And he cannot stand by and see an injured astronaut, an injured colleague and friend trapped and endangered. And so he goes in to pull the man out. And the he gets the pilot out and he is just about clear himself when an explosion forces him, drives him into a rocky outcrop. The result is he's got shattered legs and he was in a fire and people will say, how can you have a fire in vacuum? Well, if you have rocket fuels, those rocket fuels will burn. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened in this crash. So we have Glenn with shattered legs and very, very, very badly burned arm, side of his face, his side and everything like that. And when rescued and taken him for care, the doctor says, I can't believe that an astronaut in this bad a shape wants to be, has given us an advanced directive that says, rebuild me. Right. Don't kill and me. Not a don't DNR. Don't kill me. Not a DNR. He says, rebuild me. And uh, even over the protest of the doctor who treats him, there is a group of individuals that swoop in to do exactly that. Uh, you've mentioned uh, General Boatwright. Um, the character of General Richard Boatwright is actually a tribute to a friend of mine and somebody that a number of Bane authors know um, and that he was a Bane fan. Uh, and a lot of the Bane folks know him. He worked with the 1632 uh, universe quite a bit. And we lost uh, Rick right as I, just as I was writing this. And I had sent a copy to him that he never got to see. And from that moment on, I said, I know who this character's got to be. But General Boatwright and his agency steps in and takes charge of doing exactly what Glenn said, rebuilding him. No, I, th I Rick would have loved this, by the way. I, I didn't I didn't know Rick well, but like I, I met him at my first Liberty Con and he said, hey, I'm Rick Boatwright. And I just want you to know he, he'd read Witchy, I think. And he said uh, he said, I just want you to know that if you uh, ever need to talk to anybody about the technical details of how engineering devices work, here are my areas of expertise. And he, he, I can't remember, he talked about all the stuff he like had a special experience with. So he really liked this kind of hard SF sort of problem solving aspect of fiction. He did. Uh, and we had many discussions on that. And yes, this is one of the things to keep for me to have kept in mind as I was always writing it is, would Rick like this? Is this the sort of thing Rick would have liked? And, and it, it does help when you're writing hard science fiction. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. So uh, he gets two bionic legs. So this this novel's interesting, right? It has it has sort of it has sort of definite phases, definite acts, definite acts. There's a 
there's the accident and and then we see in some detail the rebuilding and the reconstruction right because that's part that's part of the story is the the thought experiment that says well what would it really look like right it's one thing to make a tv show in the 80s and it's faster stronger smarter right the the orange track suit by the way was a excellent <laughs> bit of homage <laughs> uh, that that was a bit that was a bit of fun yeah. um i wanted I, I get credited for writing military sci-fi, but I don't write combat. Mm -hmm. And the reason is I write uh, the characters and how it affects the characters. And the thing that I like most when I'm reading my own, I, I read extensively. And I like a character that I really can get to know and get to like. And I wanted to take the reader through what was happening with Glenn and uh, discussions with our editor and publisher. Um, she said, don't take it easy on him. You know, it's got to be hard. And, and I'd wanted to show that it was hard. And so we see, we see Glenn struggle. Um, we, we didn't get a lot of that from the original book. Martin Caden wrote uh, Cyborg, uh, and that came out in 1972, which was the inspiration for the TV show Six Million Dollar Man. We saw a little bit of it, of the recovery and the rehabilitation in Cyborg. We didn't see much in Six Million Dollar Man other than the one temper tantrum when he bends the railing on his, right. on his hospital bed. And I have had the privilege, the honor, of meeting individuals who have been fitted with various types of prosthetic and bionics. We do have a field of bionics and I'm privileged to have been uh, in the meetings where we look around and we say, oh my goodness, the field is really here. This is it. These are the people who created it and these are the pioneers. Well, the first thing is in the TV show and in the book, Steve Austin was not necessarily a volunteer. Uh, one of the things I had to show in the book was that Glenn Shepard was a volunteer. He asked for this. He signed up for this. And when he did, it was not what he was expecting it to be. And so we see him go through difficulties. We see him go through frustration because he wants everything to work and he wants it to be easy and it's not. And so Yes, the book goes through a number of phases. The first part really is we see the accident. We see then Glenn waking up and realizing, yeah, they went ahead and did everything you asked them to. And it doesn't always work. And it doesn't always work well. And it certainly is not easy. So we see his frustration. We see him lashing out. We see him being chastised by his aunt when she walks in on him throwing a temper tantrum at a nurse. And she comes in and she says, Glenn Shepard, I raised you better than that. And we, and I hope the reader gets a sense of the character. Um, there's also another character thrown in there. And frankly, I had created the character to tell a joke. And there is a chapter that is very much a practical joke. And that is based a little bit on real life with one of those volunteers who has a prosthetic and it is permanently, permanently mounted to his arm. Uh, it's a forearm prosthetic and it is permanently mounted with a stem. And he can take the hand or the forearm off of the mounting and it has some wireless control and he can hold your hand, he can shake your hand. And so I decided to set up, this is a little bit more, the, the story is a little more than what the actual capability is. So I, I pushed the envelope just a little bit. And I had the character of a uh, psychiatrist and I decided to give the psychiatrist the name of a friend of mine. And then when I started getting more and more into this, I had to write the friend and say, do I have your permission to have fun and make this a major character? And so 
Glenn has a best friend who's a psychiatrist, and he does little things like challenge him to a wheelchair race or sit next to his bed with a squirt gun. And when Glenn is having nightmares, he, the, the, uh, the psychiatrist wakes him up by, you know, squirting water in his face. Uh, and it's the psychiatrist friend who throws the orange tracksuit at him and says, here, put this on. It's traditional. <laughs> and so, uh, so I had a little bit of fun with that. And, and again, this was a character. And, and frankly, as a writer, it's, it's absolutely amazing to me when it happens. This was not supposed to be a major character. This was supposed to be maybe one chapter. And all of a sudden, it's like the character is sitting here telling you, no, you got to do more with me. You got to do more with that. You got to do more. And so we then have a person who is able to give us another view of what's going on inside the mind of this guy who is now a cyborg. He's, you know, part human, part machine. And that can't be easy. It just can't be easy. And I just had a friend write to me and said, you know, does this really happen with uh, people with prosthetics? And yes, it really does. They wake up and they say, this isn't, this is wrong. It doesn't work this way. It's not supposed to be this way. And that's part of what I wanted to convey. Yeah. Dr. Nix, uh, he's a great character and, and it's, you know, um, the some of the challenge of, for Shep is is physical, right? Getting the getting the the limbs to work because he gets two legs, one arm, an eye and ear, but also internal stuff, right? Because he ends up with basically an artificial heart, uh, or that's right, artificial, right? Uh, so right. there's a physical challenge, but but like you say, there's this, there's a psychological challenge, right? And and um, and so we see that in some detail. Uh, I thought you were going to tell the scene, uh, maybe this is where you were going, where there's a sort of a mandatory HR uh, kind of briefing <laughs> and, and Shep detaches his detachable forearm and it's it's communicating on its own to the briefer. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, uh, it's, uh, I, it's a lot of fun. I've used that scene in, in readings as I was working through uh, the book and the edits and everything like that. And somebody said, hey, do you want to do a reading? I go, okay. And I use that scene. It usually cracks everybody up. Um, because the other thing that I did was to try to show it from the point of view of the patients in the rehab hospital. Uh, and I I do know, um, I have a number of military friends. I have uh, spent some time with uh, the different uh, military scientific institutions and spent uh, where we're actually working on an Air Force base. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, so I try to put myself as the writer in the mind of what would someone who is a military, uh, who is a soldier, who is undergoing rehab, just how dark would their humor be? And yeah, it's uh, uh, it, it's definitely fun. So he has he detaches the army as it crawling across the uh, the uh, table, and all of these guys straight laced um, the doctors and the nurses and the orderlies and the technicians, and then all of these rehabilitating soldiers are sitting there trying to keep a straight face. Meanwhile, the HR briefer is utterly oblivious to what's going on until the very end until the very until the, the moment of communication <laughs> yes yes <laughs> Not, nice way to put that yes yeah so so there so he's got humor right which i had to say from the point of view of like a human story element um in my own experience like a sense of irony and a sense of humor is really a, an immensely powerful tool in overcoming things you know personal uh, frustration and grief it is and so sense of humor a uh, sense of community and yeah. and a support network and that's and really as we go into the second part of the book the support network becomes very very important as well 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, now, uh, is it his aunt? One someone jokes about so he gets synthetic skin on his legs. Oh, this is unrealized. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, someone realizes it's the same synthetic skin that goes on high end sex dolls. And <laughs> it's like my nephew, the sex doll. Uh, those are funny. Yes, yes. Um, so another character that we meet early that I want to sort of connect with is uh, his uh, at the at the time uh, she's his girlfriend, Yvette. Uh, yes. and she's also a doctor, uh, and, and, uh, is on the moon with him. In fact, she's the one who, um, she's like the first responder when he gets burned. Right. 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 Um, but, but in a way their relationship and the, the sort of the ups and downs and turns of that relationship drives a lot of the book. Um, let me tell us a little bit about Yvette and, and how she's different from Shep and somehow that kind of, you know, informs the plot. So the background on Yvette, well, we, we start a little bit with background on Shep. When Shep goes to medical school, he goes on an Air Force Space Force scholarship. And during his, once he's graduating, he has to do his residency. Uh, he goes to a military hospital. And it is at the military hospital that he meets Yvette. And uh, Shep is studying emergency medicine, as is Yvette. And the two of them meet. Uh, she also is on an Air Force Space Force scholarship. Uh, that's how the two of them ended up at the same place and how they get thrown together. And the very first thing that happens is they find themselves at odds with each other because the they take totally different approaches to how a patient should be treated. And one of the things that uh, we learn about is one of their very first arguments is a, a young airman who had received a crush injury to a leg. And Shep wants to amputate it immediately. And because with an amputee, with an amputation, a clean amputation and a prosthetic, the airman could go back to work. And the, and, and, and more importantly, can go back to duty. And Yvette doesn't think that should do that. They should give time to, to exhaust all of the different possibilities of trying to put the leg to get back together and everything and says, you know, you're condemning this man to a life uh, of, of not being whole, not being complete. And the, she wants to take a totally different tack on it. And yet you learn that it's the argument, it's the arguing between the two of them that brings them together. And so they are engaged to be married. And Shep learns something about what Yvette has done that affects her future, affects their future together. And, you know, essentially what it is, is she's not going to be able to have children. And Shep wanted to be able to have children, but she said, look, if we're going into space, what's the point? And yet she also does not want to stay in the service. She wants to get out and she's going to work on civilian space uh, efforts, whereas Shep, whose father was, uh, was in the Air Force, whose uncle was in the Royal Air Force and whose family had a tradition of military service says, no, I'm staying with the military service. He's in, he's going to be in Space Force. He's going to get his dream of going into space through military service. And the two of them split. And it is not a pleasant split. It is not amicable. It, it, the, whereas the arguing before was something that they could always resolve and always get to the to the end of and and not have it last this one lasts they can't resolve it they can't fix it and they go their bitter way and when shep is injured she is the doctor on moon base and yes she used her she she went the civilian route and goes into space anyway and here she is on moon base and when Shep is injured, the rehabilitation is going to take him longer than the time interval they have until that Mars mission is going to go to Mars. And while Shep is in rehab, 
Yvette gets the job and she goes to Mars in his place. Yeah. And he is not going to forget that because as far as he's concerned, everything she did, every protest she made, and by the way, she's one of the pe the doctors who signs off and says, he's not stable, he's not ready, this is too much of a, an emotional, psychological problem for us, for you to put him back out there, and so that makes him angry, she stole this from him, and that really drives uh, some further action in, in part of the story as well. Yeah, so uh, yeah, and, and, and this is, you know, I mean, we're talking about sort of so Dr. Nick is a character all the way to the end. He's right. not present in every scene equally, but he's at, he's at the end too. And, uh, you know, so uh, Shep is a guy who's had a whole bunch of trauma and huge feelings to work out. And like at this moment, he feels betrayed by his ex, right? Right. Like calls his competence into question, takes his job, right? So he's pretty pissed at her for right. a good chunk of the book. Right. Right. Um, so, uh, so by the way, so I've noticed there are a couple other, couple or three other kind of call outs, people or places I recognize. Right. So I, so I noticed as we're heading into this kind of part two, which is basically, uh, a lot of it's in Hawaii. Uh, so it's, it's, um, because, because one of the interesting kind of arguments I think you make is, hey, actually attaching someone to this much prosthetic, and correct me if I'm reading this wrong, but like that's actually wearing on the body. He says at one point, this right. hurts me all the time. Right. And and there's a sort of conclusion that, hey, if we really were to do this to somebody, probably the most place they'd be most comfortable and powerful would in fact be space. Right. Uh, you can get all the benefits, but the lesser gravity means you're not fighting the yep. the devices attached to all your limbs. Yeah. Um, so we see we see him. He goes to Hawaii and he's he's preparing to go uh, uh, back into space. He's got a high altitude, um, uh, like a space training camp. Right. Um, but I think on the way to that, we briefly see Mike, who is a writer, and Kathy, his scientist wife. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we do. Uh, we do. Uh, yeah. I placed them in North Carolina instead of uh, where they actually live. But yep. we but we do see Mike and Kathy. There's also a call out, which friends who know me from my Dragon Con appearances and the uh, and the sweet parties oh, we had standing on the balcony smoking his cigar scene. Yes, the and a certain fangirl. Uh, there is a call out to the fangirl scene, uh, yeah. which I wrote in there. And my wife's reading this. She says, "What's this all about?" <laughs> and 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 my mother, who who proofreads all of this stuff, I have to. It, it it's an interesting thing. As I write, I have to keep in mind that I I dare not embarrass my mother when yeah. I'm writing my stories, writing yep. my books. Um, but the there is a couple of callouts. We have we have that. Um, we have a few different little events with uh, friends and folks we know. Um, by the way, the uh, there there are each of the chapter starts with something called a chirp. Mm -hmm. And these are obviously meant to be something like uh, tweets and Twitter. The chirps are there to help tell the story behind the story and also to help telegraph certain call outs, uh, like the one who says, who wouldn't want to live in space where they don't have gravity bothering them? And the person who chirps is Waldo J, uh, which is uh, uh, Waldo Jones from Heinlein's story, Waldo. And Waldo lived in, a, uh, uh, in an orbital house, a space house, because he was unable to walk in Earth gravity. So there are, there's call-outs like that. The chirps also tell us a little bit um, 
they give us a glimpse at what's going on behind the scenes and also help me set up some later characters. Yeah. The names that are attached to the chirps, uh, quite a few of those are my alpha readers. Mm, cool. And uh, and so I'll I'll say this right out uh, for the alpha readers that don't realize that that is supposed to be them, uh, yes. And we um, and the, and then there's a few others as I said the um, the unnamed billionaire shows up yeah. uh, in as an alias and uh, yeah. somebody else. Yes, we we had a little bit of fun with that. The journalist named Nick Steverson gets very aggressive in the in the last. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yes. I uh, I've been uh, I'm on a uh, a Facebook Messenger chat uh that he's on and 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 I decided I was going to tease him quite a bit. Yeah. Yes. That's fantastic. My my favorite though. My favorite is and I think it's uh I think it's Shep has a copy of Homer Hickam's book Don't Blow Yourself Up which he got uh at a space conference in Arizona when he was a young man and I, it might say like when he was 20 or something. Right. Um, and you know, very well when that happened, right? <laughs> I was there. I was there. Right. So here's like, here's, here's a book in which just very, very obliquely I was there on the edge. <laughs> uh, yeah. The interstellar research conference, uh, interstellar research group conference down in Tucson. Uh, I guess about a year and a bit ago. Yeah. Um, so uh all right, so a lot of there's there's some there's some fun there's some fun uh, uh, fun call outs. Um, oh, actually, actually, I want to call it one more um, because at one point there, I think it's when they're in Hawaii and they're looking through. They look at the observatory or the observatory, the base, and they're looking at it and talking about Trappist two. Yes, yes, I had to I had to throw another Easter egg in there for the founder effect. Yes, right. And and so that's it, right? So if so if you're watching this and you have not your trap is too, what is one of that? Rob uh edited a, a very well done, very well received anthology of stories about uh human colonization of Trappist too, which is uh and which gets a little shout out in this book. So <laughs> Uh, yes, I, I I did throw I shamelessly threw uh, Easter eggs in there as well. Uh, yeah. There are, and also for anyone who has seen the HBO miniseries from the Earth to the Moon, uh, there are many quotes that are from various episodes of from the Earth to the Moon that will show up in the book as well. Yep. So, uh, Glenn. Um... So it's not, this is not like a fast, you know, look in $6 million a man, it's a training montage and we're done. It's not like that. This is maybe half the book where the sort of recovery and training is a significant right. part, right? right? So uh, he gets out to Hawaii, he, you know, he's, he's more in command of his, uh, of, of his limbs and he's figured out what he can do. And he, he takes up um, like triathlons, right? Uh, right. Or, he, or, he's, yeah. he's doing Iron something. Man. Very much like the Iron Man, except it's a future Iron Man uh, where they've made it even more difficult than what it is now. And it, and I've looked at it. I've seen the course. Uh, I know some folks who have uh, competed in the Iron Man, and it is hard. And we just made it harder for the for the book. Yes. Yeah. And and, and he learns that uh, you know he's not the fastest man on earth, but he's really fast, and he can stay fast for a long time. So he's right. sort of the fastest long distance runner maybe on earth or right. up, up in the top there. And because it's it's mechanical limbs and an artificial heart, it's relatively effortless for some parts of his body whereas a, a human a, a fully meat person, right? right. Would, uh, would would be traumatized much more by the by the run. Um, and this is where he meets uh, the the other female uh, lead and I did not read into the fact that her name is Butler. Uh, so. <laughs> um, that was that was me groping for an appropriate name. Yeah. And 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 there are elements. Uh, there are very interesting things that a character will tell you, the author, that you did not realize when you were writing the character. No. Um, uh, Jennifer Butler was meant as another way to get inside Shep's head. Yeah. What is he going through? What is he feeling? Um, I 
obviously have read and am friends with people who give us great big info dumps. Mm -hmm. And the tendency as a scientist to want to be able to tell everybody about the clever science we put behind something uh, is very, very strong. And uh, the world, world building, but uh, world buildings like underwear, you shouldn't see it, but it has to be there. Uh, like so <laughs> the so there's a lot of world building that went into describing exactly how Shep's bionics work. And the thing you just said about he's not the world's fastest human, except that he's pretty fast and can stay that way. I looked very carefully at the actual physiological uh, underpinnings of how bionics would work. If you're attaching uh, these mechanical limbs to bone and to the tendons, to the muscles, they have to be connected and operate through the hip joint. And um, if a uh, if a person is going to have an artificial arm that's artificial from here on down, it still has to attach into the rest of the body and is going to affect all of the muscles. And so what is he really going to be able to do? Is he going to be able to run 60 miles an hour? No, he's not. Is he going to be able to lift a car one-handed? No, he's not. Um, but I went through some figures and I tried to figure out what were the capabilities of the most elite athletes. And then I added 10, 15, 20% to that. Um, and mostly that was added in terms of the endurance. Mm -hmm. And so when Shep decides to challenge himself by running on his own, uh, an Ironman or the extended version created for the story, Jennifer is there to be the observer watching him do this and jennifer is also there to put the human back into the cyborg uh is and from the story point of view and uh yeah shep's damaged when it comes to relationships with women and he there there's another humorous little bit in there uh tony Weisskopf, Weisskopf told me i had to be hard on him and she said your reader's going to want to know how functional he is. And the best way to do that was actually to make it embarrassing, very, very embarrassing. And so I did. And the, so here he comes from a point of view of very badly damaged psychologically and emotionally. And Jennifer takes him at safe at face value and she's a reporter. And she wants the story, but she doesn't want the story of the cyborg. She doesn't want the story of the spaceman who's been rebuilt. She wants the story of the human who can't stop running toward danger and rescuing. And so she becomes another way to get inside his head and see what he's going through. And at the same time, provide me the author the scientist who's done all of this world building with a few little tidbits to tell the reader just how good uh just how good his hearing is just how good his vision is um with just little glimpses into him telling jennifer that he can hear people on boats offshore or that he can hear the announcer at a luau uh, somewhere up the shore. I have a friend, uh, also an author, who's currently touring in Hawaii and told me he's going to retrace every step of every place that I included in the book. Um, and every, every place you see uh, in Hawaii is somewhere I've been. And I like to do that because it's easier for me to create an entire world. I haven't been to space, so I can't create Mars as easily uh, from the imagination of being able to create an entire place. But, you know, the banyan tree in the center of Lahaina on Maui and the uh, the long straight 
trails through the lava fields on the big island of Hawaii. Um, those are all places I've been, I've seen, and have inspired me to actually include them in stories. I've actually included Hawaii in a number of different stories that I've worked on simply because it's exotic and it's, you know, and it's something that can be used to describe. And a number of people, I've I actually had a person read the EARC and write to me and say, I live in Hawaii now. I love what you did in the story. And it it it's gratifying to me to realize that I got it and described it well enough that a person who's been there can say, yeah, I've been there. You got that. That's exactly right. That's very cool. So, um, yeah, so she Shep's damaged, uh, falls in love. That doesn't, him falling in love does not fix his damage. He makes, some, he makes some bad relationship mistakes after. Um, the, the, the sort of final part of the book and where the arc with Yvette and everything kind of ultimately comes to fruition or to, to conclusion, um, uh, Jen and, and uh, Shep separate. Uh, Shep goes up into space. He's training. Um, and uh, and the uh, there's a ship called the Percheron, right? The Percheron? Right, right. That um, uh, is part of Mars X. And I th so I think it's, uh, it's both Space Force and Mars X private personnel, right? Right. Um, and they are, uh, and I don't, they're, they're not landed, they're in space, but they're out there. Right. Um, and uh, you start getting erratic messages that sort of sound like things are going nuts. Uh, some people have, some crew have died, the, the captain dies. Um, some of the messages literally sound like, uh, if, I think at this point we hear that Vet has sort of taken over the ship and she sounds like she's bonkers. Right. Right. Um, and uh, there's a great uh, uh, so Shep is so Shep is is the right guy to go help them. A he's a doctor, and and this turns out to be a medical mystery. It's a medical thriller. What is what is going on? That's and so right. People in the moon and the space station Earth are trying to think about what could be the causes. You know, is there bacteria in the food? Um, and uh, uh, Shep uh, sort of volunteers uh, slash stows away. He doesn't really stow away, but there's a um, he's a pirate. He, he's, he's, he's it's a, it's, a pirate. it's piracy. It's piracy. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, general, but with but with the assistance of General Boatwright, who basically gets him into the ship. Um, the, the reason why Shep is, and this kind of goes back to the earlier point, the reason why Shep and Boatwright say Shep is the guy to go do this is time. Because they, they, they calculate that Shep's physical body, his enhanced body, including having an artificial heart, will allow him to uh, sustain uh, at, at, at six Gs for a longer time than uh, an unaugmented person could. Right. which means the rescue ship can do a more intense initial burn, get the faster speeds, and can get out to the Percheron much faster. Right. If we could, if we could accelerate at more than one gravity, yeah. it would be possible to get to Mars in a week. In fact, we wouldn't even have to accelerate the whole way. We could accelerate um, with uh, six gravities, uh, for 10 minutes and uh, at two gravities for about a day and then coast for five days and do a nice uh, more of more like a one gravity deceleration and we could be at Mars in a week uh, as it stands right now the the home in orbit the transfer orbit that uh, is what our ships are capable of accelerating to is projected to take roughly six months. Uh, it could take as little as three months, but only if we can arrange it to be when Mars is at closest orbit. And part of the problem is since Mars is always moving, Earth is always moving, then you don't get the ideal conditions. So six months is considered to be what's probably going to be fairly typical for a trip to Mars. But 
the team on the Percheron does not have six spots. Uh, so yes, this very much is a medical mystery. Uh, Percheron went out to Mars to pick up the mission that Yvette was on and drop off more colonists, basically. They're building Mars base and they're going to have a permanent presence. So they drop off crew, they pick up a crew, and on the way back, um, yeah, some of the 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 characters, including the uh, captain, go bonkers. Oh. And I had a person ask me, did I write the entire book just to do the medical mystery of what it is that is um, poisoning or infecting or otherwise affecting the individuals? And I go, well, no, I always intended to do this bionic uh, character, but to be honest, I needed to have a reason for him to be the right person. And, the, only and person. It, the only person. And being able to withstand the high acceleration for an extended period of time was the reason. It also meant I had to go back and rewrite things. You mentioned a number of times that he has an artificial heart. And it's not so much a full heart as what's called a left ventricular assist device. Mm -hmm. And what that will do is when a person's heart beats but is weak, it can actually take some of the blood, bypass the left ventricle, and feed it out into the arteries, into the rest of the body to be more pressure and more volume than what the heart's capable of. And in Shep's case, he had to have this because he would overheat otherwise. And the but it gives him an advantage that when he is stuck at this high acceleration, the artificial heart device will keep his blood pumping and keep him uh, functional, keep him alive. Yeah. So there are other elements as well to his abilities in space and his ability to work in gravity, work in no gravity, and everything in between. And... Shep yeah. has the opportunity and he sees himself and the general agrees, his boss, we, we now know by this point that, that the general is indeed his boss. Uh, he's the only person who's going to be able to go out there because what NASA and Space Force had decided they were going to do and what, um, and, and Mars X um, is they were going to send out a robot craft and they were going to, depend on either the uh, the team back on Earth or the people on the Percheron spacecraft to bring it into a dock and everything like this. Shep says, wait a minute, if they're this bad off now, they're not going to be able to do anything to allow the the ship to dock and to bring it into a dock. And that's one of the reasons why somebody had to go along. The other thing is he felt and was right that somebody who was not affected at all needed to be on that ship to treat the people on the ship. And so that takes us into the part in which we do have a medical mystery because yeah. he gets there and frankly, every test that they had done and that was done didn't show them the problem, it wasn't food contamination, it wasn't an infection, it wasn't a toxin that anybody could see or could tell or could detect. And I'm not going to give this away other than to say it's detective work and yeah. he has to do detective work. Yeah, and this is great. Um, again, sort of hard science, you know, he gets out there, he's got to make an EVA, you know, and he's alone. There's nobody in the ship to get his back if he gets off course or something sort of get himself into and shipping back and then you know he doesn't know how much he can trust the air and so he's you know sort of paranoid almost like a stanley kubrick kind of feeling he's walking around in the spaceship and you know great scenes of some of the madness there's a there's a character who's epoxied everything down and right. offering a cup of tea and the tea is epoxy to the saucer or the, the cup is epoxy to the saucer but the tea is also tinted epoxy <laughs> like this like uh so as he's going around trying to you know 
uncertain if he can even breathe the air, right? Relying on his air from the ship, his rebreather, right? And relying on, you know, food and water, et cetera, from his ship um, as he's going around systematically uh, trying to figure out um, what's wrong and dealing with the crew, which, which can't help him. Uh, and and, and dealing with his ex. And dealing with his ex. Right. <laughs> At the same Whose time. authority he has come to challenge, right? She, right. Is, she has lost it, and he has come to challenge her authority to, in this sort of an indirect way, to sort of take back the job he lost to her, right? Right. So, uh, yeah, it's fantastic. What a, what a lot of fun. Um, it was an awful lot of fun to write this, and it's, I, I have to, to admit, that the final version is so much more than yeah. what I envisioned when I started writing. Yeah. It, 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 and it's, uh, and, and a lot of that is excellent, uh, excellent guidance. And I'll call out, give a call out now to our editor and publisher, Tony Weisskopf. Uh, Tony Weisskopf set me down we spent, uh, she came by my academic office, actually, All right. and we sat down at the conference room table with lunch and the stack of the manuscript that tall printed out double spaced single sided with red marks all over it. And we sat down and we figured it out. So there are a number of things that got added. There's um, some of the side stories, some of the drama, uh, some very specific considerations for the relationship with Jennifer, with the relationship with Yvette. And, uh, and to be perfectly honest, the entire, you know, part four of the book, um, the aftermath of solving the medical mystery is a total rewrite after sitting down with Tony and talking about what we wanted to do with it and how it should go. And all of a sudden I go, Oh my goodness, you're right. All of this has to go. It's got to be something totally different. And she said, okay, you get it, you get it. And so uh, the, the guidance on something like that is absolutely invaluable. Yeah. So Tony really is one of the great living science fiction editors. She's very, she knows her stuff. Um, she's very good. She does. And I've been inspired. I've read your work. I've read uh, a number of the Bain folks. I read, I read constantly. I have uh, Kindle on my phone and I read all the time. Currently, I'm staying away from my actual genre. I'm staying away from the hard science fiction and the science fiction as I'm trying to get some other things done, including I have ideas for a sequel. And we will finally get to see Mars. Okay. This yeah. was my next question. So that's very yeah, good. Yeah. So right. uh, I have ideas. Sounds like it's in the planning stage. So we're, we're not expecting a sequel out in December or something. No, no. I've, I've talked with Tony about it. Needed to wait a little bit. But the, but the truth of the matter is, so where would the, where would the series go? I mean, what, what do you do with this character? Um, and there's... You know, frankly, he's got unresolved issues no. still from from the rebuild, and he's got confidence issues. And I've got a character arc for him to to fulfill. Uh, there's also some other characters who are introduced along the way, uh, other individuals who have received bionic limbs, and those individuals will start to populate further stories as we go forward, because a lot of this goes back to the definition of bionics. Mm. Uh, back in the 50s and 60s, um, Dr. Jack Steele, who was an army doctor, uh, ended up actually working with the Air Force and the Air Force Research Laboratory at Wright-Patterson. And Steele came up with the idea of biologically inspired electronics and mechanical uh, devices. Now, his thoughts were things like taking advantage of how a flower opens its petals 
uh, to create a mechanism for a satellite to open its uh, solar panels. And he had other ideas of how biology could inspire um, mechanical and electronic items. He came up with the term bionic to mean lifelike or biology-like. Well, Steele was also working with the Air Force Research Lab, and the Air Force Research Lab was looking at uh, these uh, blends of uh, of cybernetics and uh, electronics, and again, the, the mechanical, electromechanical devices with humans uh, to create what they were terming cybernetic organisms or cyborgs. Mm -hmm. And it was the philosophy of this group uh, that space exploration would be best served by augmented humans. People who were more than just pure human capability. And so they saw cyborgs and bionics as a way to enable humans to get more out of space exploration. And it was that group that Martin Caden, as an aerospace engineer or an aeronautical engineer, uh, looked to and listened to as he created his character for the original book. And I then go back to that exact same concept of the bionics and the cybernetics providing an advantage to somebody in space. So essentially where I would go with sequels would be to explore this. Why is it an advantage? How is it an advantage? Um, in the $6 million man TV show, we saw Steve Austin as a spy who could go where it was too dangerous for a person to go. Well, space is going to be, space exploration, whether it's building a Mars base, an asteroid base, or anything else, is not going to be a solo endeavor. It's going to be a group endeavor. So now the question is, how many cybernetically, bionically enhanced individuals do we need? What are their jobs? What are their roles? And what is it that they can do better than anybody else can? What, are this, what is it that they can do safer than anyone else can? So I yeah. see a direction for the story to be you know, going into this whole near future space exploration and extraordinary individuals. So it's not military sci-fi, it's space opera. It's hard science space opera um, because these are extraordinary individuals doing whatever it takes to succeed. And, you know, they're heroes. They have to be heroes. And frankly, that's actually Shep's problem in The Moon in the Desert is he is a hero, but he won't admit it. And, and I, that's, that's what I would like to explore a little more of. That's very cool. I, uh, I look forward to... Uh... I mean, I know you've got other series, right? Um, so that maybe... I have one I'm closing. I have one I'm closing out. I co-author a series with my sister, yep. uh, Sandra Medlock. Uh, that one is closing out with the the next one we finish. I have a few. I have a few things on tap. I'm writing a short story uh, right now, and I have one due uh, probably this summer sometime. Oh. Um, and uh, I have also written in. Um, in John Ringo's uh, Black Tide Rising, I have a novel, which is, guess what, based in Hawaii. <laughs> um, I have a novel idea, and I, I had talked to John about it some time ago. I talked to Tony about it some time ago, but it's kind of been sitting waiting for me to, yeah. to perfect my craft a little more. And I'm, I'm ready to go back to that if they'll have it. Uh, I've got some other ideas and a few things I'd love to take on. That is uh, fantastic. Uh, well, uh, once again, it's Robert E. Hampson. Uh, folks, the book is The Moon in the Desert, out now in trade paperback. And, and also all your uh, favorite eBooks, wherever they are sold, including Bain.com. Rob, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Dave. I really appreciate it. I, this has been a lot of fun. And now we bring you Timothy Zahn's Cobra.
Earth's only hope was the Cobras. The colony worlds Adirondack and Silvern fell to the troughed forces almost without a struggle. Outnumbered and on the defensive, Earth made a desperate decision. It would attack the aliens not from space, but on the ground, with forces the troughs did not even suspect. Thus were created the Cobras, a guerrilla force whose weapons were surgically implanted, invisible to the unsuspecting eye, yet undeniably deadly. But power brings temptation, and not all the Cobras could be trusted to fight for Earth alone. Johnny Moreau would learn the uses and abuses of his special abilities and what it truly meant to be a Cobra. Gwen and Jamie were already seated at a table when Johnny arrived at the restaurant. Johnny, Jamie exclaimed, rising for a firm handshake as he joined them. It's been more than just a couple of years, but you see, we did finally get here to see you. It took Johnny a few seconds to track down the reference. Oh, right, the day I left Horizon. You're looking good, Jamie, his brother grinned. Hard but useful work, same prescription you've been following. Let's sit down, shall we? Gwen's been trying to translate this menu for me, but I think we're going to need an expert. They sat down together, and the conversation continued. And as they talked, Johnny studied the man his brother had become. Physically, of course, Jamie's transition from 19 to 35 was less of a jolt than Gwen's maturing had been. But like Gwen, there was something about him that all his tapes had left Johnny unprepared for. Jamie's teenage self-confidence had blossomed into an almost tangible air of authority and competence, an air which, almost paradoxically, had no hint of condescension to it. Accustomed to dealing with the Dominion elite, he had nevertheless not forgotten how to talk with ordinary citizens. Or else he's gone beyond even arrogance and learned how to fake sociability, he thought, and felt immediately ashamed. This was Jamie, after all the one who'd warned him not to abandon his ethics. No matter who or what Darl was, he could surely not have corrupted the younger man so thoroughly as to have left not even a trace of the tampering, from which it followed that Jamie didn't really know what kind of man he was working for. And if that was the case... Johnny waited for an appropriate opening, as a good soldier should, and as the meal drew to a close it presented itself. So when I found out Comité Darl was going to personally supervise the whole thing here, I naturally made sure to get my bid in early to come with him. Jamie took a sip of cave. He worked very hard to get the Central Committee to go along with the plan. I'm glad to see you're going to accept it, too. So Darl's got his political reputation on the line here, does he? Johnny asked casually. A flicker of uncertainty passed across Jamie's face. He's got some prestige at stake, but nothing quite that crucial. As far as you know, you mean. Jamie set his mug down carefully and lowered his voice. All right, Johnny. You don't have to prod around the edges like that with me. What's on your mind? Johnny pursed his lips. I expect you've heard by now that we killed a berserk Gantua southeast of here today. The other nodded. You may also know that in the fifteen years we've been here, no Gantua has ever shown even the slightest aggressiveness. All right. What would you say, then, if I told you I have proof the Gantua we killed had been drugged? Gwen inhaled sharply. Jamie's eyes narrowed. Drugged how? A potent hallucinogen stimulant chemical had been sprayed over the blusser reeds near where it attacked us. That's all the Gantuas ever eat, so it was a perfect way to get the stuff into their systems. A perfect way for whom? Johnny hesitated. I don't know specifically. But I'll point out that it gave Darl a lot of extra push in the vote today, and that it happened right after your ship got in. Jamie leaned back in his seat and regarded Johnny thoughtfully. I could remind you that I've worked with the Comité and his staff for several years now, and that I'm a reasonably good judge of character. I could also point out that unsupported accusations could get you in a lot of trouble. But I'd rather tackle the whole issue logically. Assuming someone aboard our ship sprayed this drug from orbit, why hasn't every other animal in that area gone crazy as well? Even if we dropped a mist bomb or something, and I don't even know if our approach path was anywhere near there, there should have been some dispersion. Johnny exhaled through clenched teeth. All right, then. Someone on your ship must have had an agent down here with the stuff all ready to spray. You only had a few hours' warning, though, didn't you? Gwen spoke up. 
Could something the size of a gantua ingest enough of the drug that fast? It would probably have needed a massive initial dose, Jamie agreed. And in that case, why coat the Blessa plants at all? He frowned. Though I'll admit the Comité has been very interested in Aventine flora and fauna recently, and I remember Blessa reeds showing up in some of the studies I worked on. How were they mentioned specifically? Johnny asked, leaning forward. Let's see. Jamie stared into his cave. If I remember correctly, it was part of a strategic mineral study he was having us do. Something about Aventine becoming self-sufficient in case the troughed corridor was closed. I dug out the fact that your Blessa plant is unusually good at concentrating some metal, I forget which one, especially in late autumn. And from this study, he almost undoubtedly learned that gantuas are the only things larger than insects that feed on Blessa plants, Johnny said grimly. So his agents inject massive doses of hallucinogen into a few gantuas and spray the blussa nearby to ensure they don't come down from their high until they've attracted our attention. Johnny, you're edging very close to sedition here. Jamie's voice was barely audible, his hand rigid as it clutched his mug. Even if what you're saying is true, you haven't got a shred of evidence to point to the comité himself. Not yet, but maybe you can get that evidence for me. Jamie's face seemed to become a mask. What do you mean? If anyone aboard your ship is involved in this, they'll almost certainly have had communication with their agents here. You can pull the radio log and look for coded transmissions. For a long moment, Jamie locked eyes with his brother. You're asking me to be disloyal now, he said at last. Am I? If Darl's implicated, shouldn't that fact be brought to the attention of the entire Central Committee? And if someone's working behind his back, for whatever reason, shouldn't you find out and let him know? And if the whole thing's some homegrown Aventine plot, wouldn't I be betraying the trust Comité Darl's placed in me? Jamie retorted. Jamie, you've got to help me, Johnny said carefully, fighting to keep any hint of his desperation from creeping into his voice. Jamie was right. He hadn't any proof that Darl was manipulating Aventine politics. And unless he could get it, the Comité's plan would go ahead unchecked. Don't you see how the continual presence of cobras is going to warp our society? I don't want Darl's cobra factory set up on Aventine, and I sure as hell don't want it here for a fraudulent reason. He stopped abruptly, embarrassed by his outburst. Jamie ran his finger absently around the rim of his mug, then looked up at Gwen. What are your thoughts on this? he asked her. She shrugged fractionally. I've barely been here a day, Jamie. I really can't say anything about the benefits versus drawbacks of this so-called Cobra factory. But if Johnny says it'd be bad... She grinned. You know how everything Johnny says and does is right. Jamie relaxed, smiling back. That's only because he wasn't around during those critical, formative years when you were busy fighting with me, he said. Johnny was doing a lot for the Dominion during those years, she replied softly. Jamie looked down at his cave again. He was, wasn't he? He took a deep breath, pursed his lips. All right, he said at last, looking Johnny in the eye. I guess I can risk the comité's anger for something that's this important to you. But I won't be able to simply give you any logs I find. I'll analyze them myself and let you know if there's anything out of the ordinary. They're all technically confidential, after all. Johnny nodded. I understand. And I wouldn't be asking you to do this if there was any other way. Sure. Raising his mug, Jamie drained the rest of his cave and stood up. I'll call you as soon as I have anything. He nodded to them both and left. Johnny leaned back with a sigh of relief. If this worked... I hope you know what you're doing. He looked over to find Gwen's eyes on him. If it works, I should have at least enough indirect evidence to get Jew and the Council thinking about what they're doing to Aventine. And if it doesn't, she rejoined quietly, you'll have risked maybe ruined Jamie's career for nothing. Johnny closed his eyes. Don't remind me. He sat like that for a moment, feeling the tension of the day turning to fatigue and soaking into his bones. Well, he said, opening his eyes and getting to his feet, what's done is done. Let me get a car to take you to a hotel for the night. What about you? She asked as they headed for the exit. I'm staying at the Dominion Building office tonight, he told her grimly. It occurs to me that I've got information there that someone may think worth stealing. I almost hope they try it. 
but the packet from the scientific team in Niparan was untouched when he arrived, and nothing but uncomfortable dreams disturbed his sleep. That was another installment in our ongoing audiobook serialization of Timothy Zahn's Cobra. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks as always to audible.com and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. Praise, thanks, and gratitude to Robert E. Hampson for sitting down with us today. And good night, Tony Daniel, wherever you are. This is David Afshirod coming to you from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. Thank you.